Oh, I'll hold that. No, no, it's not what I meant. <laughs> Electrons to three phase or single phase? That is the question. Ration. <laughs> Do I say anything? <laughs> Do you feel like you've been put on the spot? <laughs> you talk. The, the, po- the talking stick is pointing at you. <laughs> we need to figure out how we're going to split this electricity around the boat. There's lots of new sources and there's lots of places to put it. With little money, lots of support, Kiwi ingenuity and good old blood, sweat and tears, we're creating a community expedition and research boat built and run by volunteers from around the world because life is too short not to fight for your dream. I took a stroll downtown this evening When I heard music echo through the night The same old songs that I heard the night before So I started running so I wouldn't be too late And this is because there's going to be new things like generators and motors and all sorts. So we've got to figure it all out and that's what this is today. Can you turn it around? And these two are going to be doing that. So this is, this is like hour one, day one of a couple of days of mind mapping the whole boat out. So basics of what we're looking at. The Cummins has alternators um, that are going to spit electricity off. The gearbox has a three phase motor that's going to use electricity. The get, which is the get home motor. Uh, five kilowatt genset downstairs. We have to figure out how that single phase genset fits into the system. 50 kilowatt genset, three phase. We have to figure out how that fits into the system. Solar, DC comes in from the roof. We have to figure out how we're gonna do that into the whole system. Wind is also AC and or DC, depending on the generator we use. We have to figure out how to put that into the system. And then shore power, is that gonna be three phase or is that gonna be single phase 15 amp 240 volts? These and other questions will be answered in but a moment. <laughs> so our big challenge is we've got all these building blocks and we know some things are fixed. We know we're going to have an engine, it's mm. going to have Cummins engine. Yeah. We know we're going to have three phase uh, to some extent, at the very least the limp home motor somewhere upside down yep. in this diagram. Get home. Go. Yep. Get home. So we're going to have some fixed three phase uh, distribution in the boat anyway. We know that. That's fixed. What we need to work out is how we're going to distribute power around the boat itself. Is mm. it single phase? Is it three phase? and so uh, really just trying to match up all the building blocks and try and figure out which is the most efficient and the most productive for us. Yeah, and sometimes we may not necessarily need three phase around the boat, so we're kind of figuring out do we even, like is it overkill to do certain things or whatever so that we can figure out the most effective design. And this is, uh, with the hope, that someone like me who does not know electricity or like it particularly um, will be able to follow along. So um, I'm on the sofa because I've had a little Sit back. So um, the doctors aren't sure whether I have appendicitis. Go figure. Um, or it's um, it's something because I've got sort of stuff happening with my gut all the time. So they're they're not quite sure what it is. But um, I actually get the doctor's call today with the results to find out whether I'm here tomorrow or in hospital getting something pulled out. We'll we'll see. It's all good. It's an infection. Antibiotics are working great. So. What we're looking at getting is the, uh, the genset, which has three-phase output. And one of the questions we're trying to resolve right now is, do we need all of those three phases to run the house load? So that is all of the other non-limp home motor type loads. And the key question is, can we run all of that off a single phase in that, uh, the, the generator in the genset, or are we going to need the three phases? AC, or alternating current, power, is classified into single phase or three phase. Single phase is used when electricity requirements are low. Three phase is used when running large machinery or big load. Because single phase power has peaks and dips in voltage, it's not as constant as three phase power supply, which delivers power at a steady, constant rate. Three phase is more efficient and can transmit three times as much power. Single phases use when loads are like lighting or heating, for example, rather than large electric motors. Essentially, the single phase uh, will provide a third of the total output uh, of what the three phases would push out with the gen set. So Damien and I are just going through and doing the calculations, uh, and we're doing two things. One is we're cal- calculating all of the likely loads uh, around the boat to work out the, the house load, 
and can that be supplied through a single phase through a third of the total power being what did we work out uh, the single phase power 16.6 kilowatts 16 kilowatts yeah so if we can get the whole house load within 16 kilowatts we could actually run it off single phase which is cheaper uh, because we don't have to uh, get as many inverted charges since we're just running off single phase or if it's above 16 uh, kilowatts then we have to access uh, the three phases uh, from the gen set which actually makes that more efficient because they're there available anyway yeah um, so it means actually we can provide a much higher uh, or provide for a much higher load for the boat uh, that's a good thing but ultimately it means that we'll have to get three inverter charges uh, one for each phase all doable uh, but it does push the cost up a little bit. So this is the balance that we're trying to strike right now. Let's say we're doing a Sunday afternoon roast uh, as an example. So the oven could be going, multiple cooktops could be going. You wouldn't want to go around then turning on the toaster and then turning on the jug and so forth. It's all protected, it's not dangerous. Uh, but what we're trying to do is make sure we don't exceed the load and therefore trip a breaker, which some people in their houses might recognise. Uh, I hear you know, people say, you can't turn on the iron and you can't turn on the toaster at the same time or the vacuum because it'll, it'll pop a circuit breaker. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's the bit we're trying to figure out. We, we're trying to not inconvenience anyone by having to limit loads. Mm, nice. This is like watching the professor scroll on a 10 foot tall blackboard. 47 different thousand calculations, etc. Another spin, spin around. Look at that here. Turn, no, turn around. So there we go. <laughs> that almost looks like it was meant to be there. I'm, it's like it's all layered perfectly. I'm, I'm in training for a shampoo commercial <laughs> just for men because you're kind of worth it. So the only reason why we're looking at doing three inverters is because we're looking to charge the battery bank from the three phase generator. But what if we took that out of the equation? What if we say that generator won't charge the battery bank? What if we find another way of charging the batteries? How have we do that? So I reckon that's a, that's a good way to look at it. And conceptually, could we get three high, pretty high amperage charges? Yeah. Each one of those, which will be a lot cheaper than a, a like inverter an charger. Like an 80 amp charger or something. Something like that. Yep. yep. Hang yep. it off, and, and they'd be running off each of the three phases. Yeah. So you've got three chargers running off the three phases yep. uh, onto the battery bus. Yeah. And then we'd be able to use a single 15 kilowatt inverter charger. In fact, you're not even using the charger bit of it, it's really the inverter we're using. But we wouldn't need to have a smart inverter at that point. No. Nope. So that rules out the need for having an $8,000 Victron. You could have a $2,000, Yeah. well, more than that, probably three, dollars $4,000 something. But. We'd have to figure out how to bring the solar in, but that would come in differently anyway. We could manually switch it. We would, another thing about the architecture here. Here's another piece of paper. I bought three of these pads for a reason. <laughs> You'd be able to balance your phases too if yes. you ran the three charges. Well, they would automatically Perfect, perfectly be balanced. balanced. Great. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so here's our generator. Here's our phase one, phase two, phase three. So these are these are simply charges. Yeah. Hello. Howdy, howdy. Hey, Maddie. Sorry, giving you some volume. All right, hello. How's that? I have a, an angry Mr. Tatters here because I put him on a diet. Oh. <laughs> Your name is Matt. Uh, he goes between the, I love you, feed me. Why aren't you feeding me, chomp? <laughs> <laughs> Jess does the same so. thing. <laughs> no comment. No, no, don't go there. <laughs> so how y'all? Oh yeah, yeah, good. You need to come back. So, oh. yeah. The conversation is just perfect. We were just going into Victron and yeah. charging and how, how long can we run with so many batteries and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. We have a few different things going on. We've got a three phase, 50, uh, 40 kilowatt three phase generator. Um, okay. We've got a five kilowatt single phase generator. Uh, okay. we, we're going to aim for five kilowatts of solar. I don't know if we'll get there, but we're going to aim for five kilowatts of solar. Um, and uh, there's going to be wind generation. I don't know how big, but well, whatever. It's, it's going to be small, a kilowatt or two. So solar does nothing when you get really, really far south. Um, and, that, and that's where wind comes into its own. 
Yeah, so what we, what we did, Maddie, yesterday was we sort of looked at the whole power consumption bunch of scenarios and profile on, on Broodpeg, and there was a bit of a wish list of all the things that would be on board, so, you know, going down air conditioners and ovens and pretty thirsty sort of stuff. So if we had everything on board running at exactly the same time, including your short time things like microwaves, kettles, and this is not practical, yeah, you get to about the 15 kilowatt point. And you go... Okay, that's not completely unreasonable. Not unreasonable. Uh, we were talking this morning, so what if we talk about a sustained load or a nominal load? And we're getting to the point now, and these guys run off five kilowatts right now. Uh, I'm going to say reasonably comfortably. There are a few extra things that'll, that will come in. Um, kilowatt peak loading or kilowatt hours? Peak. peak. Sorry, just to clarify. Peak. 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 Yeah. Okay, so right yes. now peak, you're only doing five, so you're looking yeah. to triple it in a, in a dream situation. That, that, yeah. And that, I think we actually called it dream <coughs> of comfort. Yeah. Oh, I did. I called it dream comfort situation. Dream. So there you go. <laughs> oh, that's well, just, don't pull thing. any punches. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tear. I can see a tear coming out. <laughs> As a percentage, how much would we save if we bought it off the shelf versus made it? I have to do the number. I'm going to take a, a real out of the air 50%. Okay. Oh, the okay. reason why, by the time it's all said and done, let's round it up to say 200 US dollars per kilowatt hour. Yep. What did you pay for these? Mm. Oh, so basically, we'll need 10 of your. So it's $12,500. Yeah. Oh, these are good chops to go with the fish. <laughs> now that we know the system we're building, where does it all fit in Brewpeg? So as a cutaway, this is front to back on Brewpeg. We've got the fuel tanks, the engine room, the storage compartment, the two lower cabins, the two water tanks, the coffer dam, the two fuel tanks, and the crash bulkhead. Now all of that is below this line here, which is the main deck. Then we've got above deck, we've got the anchor room, the cabins and galleys, the wheelhouse, and the saloon. Now there's this little space just in here. This is really critical for the electrics and also the engine room and how they connect. And there's one final piece of the puzzle up here. We've got our solar panels and our wind turbine. All of that needs to fit together and work as one unit. This is the system we're designing with the new funds from the GoFundMe campaign. We have a lot going on in the engine room. We've got a single phase 240 volt, five kilowatt diesel generator, a three phase 50 kilowatt, 415 volt, diesel generator, a 30 kilowatt electric motor that runs on three phase, 415 volts. And we've got the main Cummins engine, which has a 24 volt alternator, direct current or DC. All of these are AC, so this is a much higher voltage. And DC is what we're running our start batteries on as well as our house bank initially that may change. The solar is gonna be based on a much higher voltage. So it's looking like the solar voltage will be at least 150 volts. The higher, the better but that just depends on the layout. We'll get to that in a moment. The same happens with our wind turbine up here. The voltage will be DC. It'll be somewhere between 24 and 48 volts, depending on the model that we buy. And that will be pumping uh, voltage back into our batteries for later use. So this little square box here is our storage area for our batteries, electronics, inverters, fuses, all of that sort of stuff. It's probably the best place on the boat that we can put this. The reason I say that is because it's completely isolated from outside water. It's, it's a very, very internal part of the boat and there's no way that water can get to it. It's also in an air-conditioned room. So the wheelhouse is completely air-conditioned as well as all of our monitoring and so on sits up here. So it's a short cable run down to the batteries and so forth. But because it's air-conditioned and we're able to exhaust hot air out of this room quite easily through the ventilation that we have in the back of the wall here, we're able to keep the inverters and, and all of the electronics running at a decently low temperature. If you have them without too much ventilation, you'll heat that room up very fast. So that's one of the reasons why we've designed this room the way we have, and also why we've put the batteries in this area because it works so well for protecting them long-term. Over the years, there's been a lot of chit chat about Brewpeg going to sea with one main engine. And it's pretty normal in the commercial world to have a single main engine like what we do in Brewpeg. 
it's less so in the recreational world. And the difference being is that smaller, higher revving diesels like you see in the recreational world where they might be a smaller capacity in terms of litres, uh, but a much higher horsepower, the engines are generally more stressed than what you'd see in Brewpeg. Brewpeg has a very big, solidly built engine and it's not putting out a huge amount of horsepower. And therefore the engine itself doesn't go under as much strain and you get a lot more reliability out of it. So that's why it's normal in the commercial world to be able to accept going to sea with a single main engine. However, we want to get back no matter what. So we're putting a get home safe motor into Brewpeg. Some people have said put a wing motor in, and a wing motor for those that don't know is a separate engine off to the side that has a separate propeller shaft, propeller, etc. If we put a wing motor in, it'll be the first thing to get swiped off the bottom when we go into the ice. There are a small shaft, a small propeller, small engine, um, and it's offset quite a bit. So when you're um, having to power home with a uh, get home wing motor, you've got a huge big propeller down the back that isn't turning and all it's doing is providing drag and the boat ends up skewing quite a lot. It's actually quite hard to control a boat under a wing motor. It's just the completely wrong thing to do for a boat like Brewpeg. So we're gonna be using a central get home safe electric motor that powers the main shaft. Now, if our main engine stops for whatever reason, We've done the research into the gearbox. We are able to spin the output shaft of the gearbox without the input shaft spinning, and therefore we've got enough oil capacity and lubrication and everything to be able to do that indefinitely. Now, we are gonna be putting a lube pump on the gearbox so that we can actually run forced lubrication through that gearbox so that absolutely, no matter what, we know that we're not gonna damage the gearbox by running the get home safe motor. The get home safe motor is a 30 kilowatt electric motor, and it's powered by our 50 kilowatt gen set. Now, normally you'd have a much bigger gen set to power a 30 kilowatt motor. However, we're going to be building a soft start that's going to very, very slowly ramp up the power on the 30 kilowatt because we're size limited with our 50 kilowatt gen set. We physically can't fit a bigger gen set into the back end of the boat. So although it's, it's not a perfect balance, it's all we can do. So we, we've found a way to make it work. So that's the, um, the next thing that Duncan and I are trying to figure out and solve is the controllers around how we drive the soft start on this 30 kilowatt motor. So if we are steaming along and for whatever reason this main engine stops working, power will be sent from the 50 kilowatt generator across to the 30 kilowatt motor and then down a belt drive and there'll be a gear reduction system that we're building into here. It'll spin the main prop shaft and then the propeller will turn as per normal. We can get about five knots using a 30 kilowatt motor spinning this main shaft, we can get about five knots. So we're gonna be slow when we're running under get home. Um, however, we can run under get home you know, fairly indefinitely. The generator burns about 10 to 11 liters per hour and Brewpeg holds 16,000 liters of fuel. So you know, we've got a fair whack of range um, if we're powering under that gen set and get home motor uh, as, as is. Now also the gen set rating, when we are running under continuous load like that, um, the output is scaled down to 40 kilowatts and that just basically means the generator itself is not gonna you know, nuke itself and, and um, overstress itself. So it'll do up to 55 kilowatts if we need it in standby, um, which is just bursts of power. But if we're pulling continuous high load out of it, then we downrate it to about 40 kilowatts. And that's all possible to do with the system that we're building. Now the other side of it is that if we're, everything's working normal and we just need a little bit of power, we'll actually just run the five kilowatt generator. And the reason being is because generators don't like being run with low load. They like to be run about between 60 and 80% load. They don't like it when you're below that. They start to glaze the bore on the engine itself. So that's why we have two quite different sized generators. In an ideal world, we'd probably have a 10 kilowatt generator, but this is what we have. Um, and it works for the system that we've built. Now the solar and wind will be coming in as DC and they'll feed themselves down into this box here, as well as the AC power from the engine room that comes up and feeds into this box. Now in this box, we're gonna have a few pieces of equipment. So in that battery box, we're gonna have a three phase inverter. Now we were looking at something like Victron, um, but the value wasn't there for what we need to do. Victron's amazing. Victron is kind of like the Rolls Royce of boat gear in terms of electronics and inverters and stuff like that. However, um, because of some of the limitations that it had and because we're doing weird things more than anything else It's us not Victron. That's the limiting factor here um, It blew the cost out of the water because we had to do so many strange and wonderful things in order to get everything to work So we started looking at other options and what we found was commercial solutions that are used in like commercial applications, solar and, and you know large-scale generation and stuff 
they have some solutions that were going to work really, really well. And that's my background. So prior to doing um, Brewpeg full time, I actually used to sell large scale solar and battery installations. So I do understand what's available in that world. And uh, by, by pulling on some of that expertise from, from you know, past contacts of mine and so on, we were able to put together a solution that we think is actually going to be pretty, pretty darn neat. What it allows us to do is tie in the generators, the wind and solar, as well as the shore power. So shore power is something that we have to factor in um, whenever we pull up to a wharf and we want to actually take power from the wharf as opposed to from our gen set. So this is obviously based on common voltages that we see in Australia or New Zealand. So 240 volts, AC, single phase, 15 amps max is our most common. Um, the next one up that's a high powered one is 415 volts and you can get anywhere between sort of 20 and 50 amps with that. So you can get a fair whack. That is three phase, so you do have to have three phase equipment to use it. Um, you can split the phases out and start using single phase off them, but it, it gets more complicated and generally we try and sort of keep them apart. If you've got a three phase boat or a single phase boat, you know, that's it. So we're not factoring in different voltages around the world. Um, for example, if we go to Europe and they're using 220 volts, uh, or if we go to America and they're still using Imperial 110 volts, we're not going to be allowing the boat to plug into shore power in those areas. We'll just run the gen set. Um, because most of our load is going to be covered by solar and wind, we're pretty happy with that system. Um, in our previous boat, we didn't have a generator. We were 100% reliant on solar and wind, and we were able to modify our lifestyle to be able to take account of that. Um, Brewpeg, we're just going to build a similar system but bigger. So we're going to live under the same philosophy of, of keep the boat as self-sufficient and independent from shore power as possible. And then if it's there and it's available, great, we'll plug in. Um, if it's not, we don't need it, so we'll, we'll carry on without it. Um, this system has taken Duncan and I and Jess and Madison and Graham um, and uh, Daniel in the States has taken us uh, you know, a huge amount of time to basically go through and figure out there's so much went into it. We can't obviously put it all into the video because there was there was two days of just absolute cramming of you know diagrams and calculations and everything. So um, we try to give you a bit of a flavor of what it was like. Uh, this is this is the system that we've come up with and we've road tested it with every way we can think that it could fail and we're really happy with what we've we've built. Um, now we're able to start ordering the gear from the GoFundMe. We're able to spec the gen set, the get home motor, um, the inverters. Like we're able to really build a system now that we not only do we have the funds to buy the equipment we need, but we've actually had the expertise and the brain power put into it that we can build and design a system that's going to be really robust going forward. So a huge thanks to everybody that's been involved in creating this system. Um, Brewpeg is going to be so cool. Um, when this all gets put into the boat, it's going to be such an awesome system and it's going to be a real testament to the skills of the people that have helped design it. We've got some progress happening on the engine. It's going to Brisbane. It's getting rebuilt. Carl's agreed to do it. We kind of thrashed out the details. We know roughly what we're doing. I was going to drive it down myself, but I managed to get a freight price of $240, I think it was, um, to send it down. So I need to build a little frame to get this engine on so we can get the whole thing down in one piece. Well, my plan is, got a little bit of steel. I'm gonna build a frame to go into the engine so that it's easily forkliftable and it can't fall off. My plan using these bits of steel is to essentially create a link between front and rear and then also a couple of um, box section bits that we can use for the tines on the forklift. But I want it so that it's boltable on or off really easily and then Carl can take it off, rebuild the engine and then put it back on when he's finished and send it back to us. I'm also going to weld a box to it for all of the random parts that aren't getting bolted onto the engine. In the background, we've got a bunch of painting going on. So there's door frames and the, the actual door itself, a whole bunch of stuff that we're just waiting on it to dry. And a bit of news, I've found a freight agent that can get our parts in from overseas. It's a bit of a mission to import parts into Australia via sea freight. Air freight's actually much simpler because you don't have to pay a lot of fees. It's all sort of incorporated into the actual air freight price. 
But when you do sea freight for anything heavy, you've got a stack of fees and you have to pretty much get a customs agent to help you through it. I found a customs agent. I got an air freight price to bring the gearbox in and that was $17,500. But it's probably a bit out of our price range. Um, so it looks like we can bring the gearbox and the generator in for about $3,000 worth of fees. Um, sounds like a lot but that's kind of just what you deal with in Australia so um, I'm really happy with this I kind of like the feeling I get talking to this um, uh, this woman based in Brisbane that's the the agent so see how that goes I need to lift it level but it's sitting like a triangle it's got sort of two spread feet there and then the center is basically sitting on a very narrow little square piece just here it scares me lifting it off that so I've got to figure out a better way got to pick this end up and get it basically level Just go up real slow. Okay, Woo. Okay, just go down there and see what it's like. How far is it gonna come down? Uh, oh, probably that far. Uh, oh, it's gonna go more up more, eh? Um, righto. Sorry, say that again. Yeah, right. Just got to find a few more blocks. Uh, Brisbane for a rebuild. Just need to get something a bit higher for the um, for one side. Yeah, this should do it. Yes, yeah, it's heading down for a rebuild hopefully this week if I can get it down there. Go there. Uh, just come up a bit, it's only sitting on this one side, I'll just fix that. Okay, try that. Uh, just go back up. Okay, try that. Does that look level to you? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah awesome, that'll do. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Like all good designs when you're doing something with heavy machinery, I'm making this up as I go along. I'll show you what I'm thinking. This material I found at the scrapyard, I've got no idea what size it is. It's, I don't know, 120 by 65 mil, something like that roughly. Looks like it's about six or possibly eight mil wall section. Probably, probably six, possibly eight. That one looks like six, could be four. Don't really know. This bit here I'm gonna cut in half. That's gonna be my forklift tine lifty points. These two longer pieces, what I'm thinking is one down either side and go, from that mount there to that mount there on either side forklift lifting points underneath they can be relatively low because i'm going to use this box section to basically come up from the from like the beam going that way i'm going to come up from the to the engine mount at each four corners um that's my thoughts this is just a bit of random stuff that i saw and i thought ah it might be useful let's grab it and if it works it works 126 three one, two First step, let's chop this blue bit in half.
curb like that, it's probably stable enough. Yeah. Something like that, how much room have I got? Not a lot. I'm just gonna bolt this beam straight to the engine. I'll cut this off on an angle, and that way we can just drill and basically get it straight into there. There's enough room to clear everything on the engine by sort of 10 mil or so, plenty of room. So we'll do that. Um, and then I'll just drop the, some you know, beams down onto these tines. Something like that. edge here is too close to the bolt so let's just get rid of the edge now that I've got that design figured out I just need to make a carbon copy of that for the other side and then we can drill the holes bolt it on and start welding the verticals Okay, so forklift seems to be no more than 860. Right, I need four standoffs, 150 mil high. Hot, hot. 
also hot. It's an old trick, if you don't have heat proof gloves, find the oiliest rag that you have available to you and lift it with that. I think we'll whack that in with a hammer. Ow, still hot. Less hammer. Okay, that one needs a little bit of backfill. Let's get them square and then weld them. That's looking pretty smart and pretty safe, but I think we need to increase the safety. Nothing says I'm doing safe things like fluorescent orange. So that came out pretty nice. I'm happy with that. Nice and rigid. Forklift can pick that up really easy and it's not going to tip over. The plan is I need to put this back together so we can freight it. So I'm just loosely going to bolt everything on so we can get it down to Carl. It's going down there to be rebuilt. First he's going to strip it down and acid bath everything and then rip out all the liners and start working on the deck height. So what that means this surface will get re-skimmed, so basically surfaced off. The liners will get removed, and then the recess that's cut into the block will get dropped down so that the liners will have a perfect protrusion going from the top of here to the top of the liner itself. So that's a really integral part of rebuilding it. Really stoked that the block is gonna get decked so that we can start absolutely perfectly from scratch. And we've got Dennis arriving uh, on the train uh, tomorrow, so we're gonna pick him up in the afternoon. And probably one of the first jobs that we do, we'll have a rest, because I think we'll both be probably knackered, um, is we'll start getting the engine back together um, and that'll also allow us to get that sent off. Then we'll start clearing out the engine room ready to pull the main engine out of that room so we can clean it all out, get it ready to start putting in the new gear. Awesome. I'll go grab the keys.
dinner's arrived, the guys will put that back together and get that freighted down to Carl. In the meantime, Damien's finishing off some framing, put some doors on. Thanks for getting us here. What an amazing milestone. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys.